are in Psalm 68. I'll have you turn on over there. And I wonder, there's 35 verses, so it's kind of a a long section, and we're going to take it uh, kind of piecemeal all the way through. Instead of just reading the whole entire thing, we'll just kind of take it as it it goes along. But um, expect God to speak to you. Because a lot of times, you know, even as we read our Bible for ourselves and our devotion time and as we kind of read through, let's say you do a chapter a day or five chapters, whatever you do, but in reading that, if there's not the expectation that he's going to speak to you in it, a lot of times then we're just doing our duty. We're just reading, you know, and, uh, and so ultimately even tonight. I, I wonder what verse or what phrase or what truth is going to, uh, to be there specifically for whatever's happening in your life. And so uh, let's anticipate that. And so God, as we step into this psalm written 3,000 years ago by our friend King David, and God, there's these things that you wanted to convey to us in this psalm. Lord, here we are tonight. And as we had communion, we've confessed our sins before you, asked for your forgiveness. We believe that you have, in fact, forgiven us because that's what you say you will do if we confess our sins. And so we've made our souls clean in uh, our communion time. We've worshiped you in song, and now we worship you in your word. We really do desire, uh, Lord, to, to hear from you. And God, we desire your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled our message, The Onward March of God. Here's a couple things that's happening in our psalm. Uh, so as we go through it, we kind of understand what we're, what we're looking at. It is a song of praise. That's the category it fits in as far as the 150 psalms go. It's a song of praise. But this Psalm 68 uh, contains uh, various themes suggesting it's like a collection of songs brought together. And so you, we've all heard a, a medley before. Let's say it's three or four songs that are kind of sung together or back to back. And, and so this is David's version of a medley um, because at first I'm gonna say, wait, it just kind of skips topics and just moves to the next thing. And at first it's like, David, what, what are you doing here? And once, once I had read that, it's like, okay, then my linear brain can kind of settle down for a minute and realize it's okay. You can jump topics uh, when you're writing a song or a hymn. Also in Psalm 68, it describes this onward march of God through history to his final triumph. And so you can hear about judgment. And with it, it's that judgment in the end. That anyone who is his enemy, he will destroy. And it's, it's, it's language like that, but think about it. Any unbeliever, anyone who doesn't repent and believe that ultimately hate God. And he'll even use that imagery in there. They're an enemy of God, hatred towards God. Even you and I, before we came to Christ, before we had a relationship with them, that is the wording that is used there. And it's, it's serious language. The threefold reference to his sanctuary suggests it was written to celebrate the the bringing back of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 6 is this story, and that seems, most of the writers, most of the commentators really seem that that seems to be the background for David writing this. And so briefly, just kind of remind you of that story in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it's really that, that whole chapter there, David is the king. And he is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. But he didn't do it the right way. So what had happened earlier, a lot of times they would bring that Ark of the Covenant. And so this two foot by four foot wooden box that's overlaid in gold, two big golden angels on top. And then there was poles on each side that the bearers of the Ark of the Covenant would carry that, the Levite priests. But a lot of times they would take it out when they were fighting and they did it to when uh, they were, Israel was fighting the, the Philistines and the Philistines ended up taking it. And uh, so it's been gone uh, for, for a while. And David uh, knows where it is and he's going to go get it back. But what he did is instead of having the proper way, the Levite priests carrying it to, to move it, instead he has it placed on this new cart the little picture an oxen cart, and it's a brand new cart, and so he thought, that'd, that'd be a way to do it. And in route, 
one of David's men, Uzziah, or Uzzah, excuse me, he uh, kind of hit a pothole, if you will, and it starts to bobble, and he, he studies it. God strikes him dead on the spot. Everybody just freezes. And David's a little bit, you read the, the text there, he's a little bit ticked off at God. Like, like, why would you do that? He was just trying to study it so it wouldn't fall and not understanding that he's doing this all the wrong way. Doing the right thing, bringing it to Jerusalem, but doing it the wrong way. And that's where we have the, the five books of Moses in the beginning of it. And there was some serious detail given to how exactly you move it. He just forgot that part. So basically what he does then after Uzzah's death is he parks it at a guy named Obed-Edom's house and just leaves it there for three months. And then word gets back to him that God is blessing him radically just because it's at his house. And so he says, okay, I'm going to go get it. And so as he goes and gets it, this time he had, I guess, read, went back and read the law and he's having the bearers of the ark to carry it this time. So he's doing it the proper way. And what I like about this story is they, they take six steps and they stop and they set it back down and everybody goes berserk. They're just like, yeah, we made it. All right. Okay, we're good. We're going now. And, and they're able to take it and take it all the way back to uh, Jerusalem. So those had to be some scary steps because it's like, especially for the guys carrying it, you know, is God going to do something else and maybe he doesn't want it moved. And, and that's where David danced unto the Lord. And that's where his wife, Michal, ends up rebuking him for doing that. And that famous statement, I will, even, uh, I will be even more undignified than this. Because he's running around in his boxers, you know, and he's singing and shouting. But he's just undone unto the Lord and just praising him for it was. And, and, and that's kind of the, the chapter of that. And so with the ark. Now, because they would take the ark and oftentimes bring it to military things that were going on, it was all about, not a good luck charm, but the presence of God. That's where God dwelt. And so with that, as we think of that Ark of the Covenant, and he'll mention the, the temple two or three times, and, and so with that, with that imagery there, think of God's presence, God with them, God with us today. I wonder... Well, let's read the, uh, we're going to get into the first section here. Uh, parade of praise in verse 1. And so, I was in Luke. Let's get back to Psalm here. Okay, Psalm 68, verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David, a song. And it starts here, he says, God shall arise. His enemies shall be scattered. And those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, and so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exult before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Like it seems like it would be good enough just to be joyful, but to be jubilant with joy, I think kind of doubles that. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts, his name is the Lord, exalt before him. And I love this script, these two scriptures. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God set, uh, settles the solitary in a home or the lonely in families is another way of saying it. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. We'll pause right there. This parade of praise, that's what we start with. David's sure about God's presence, as we talked about, being symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant. Whatever enemy you're dealing with today, do you believe God's presence is with you? And do you believe this then for your, your life? That what he says is, your enemies will scatter. And as they have this presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant, you and I have the presence of God with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, God himself dwelling inside of us here. Let me pause for a second and give just, uh, again, a little bit more background of why we know what's happening here. I wanted to read verse one before I mention this next part. But David tips us off to the context by quoting here as he starts off in this first verse, he's quoting Numbers chapter 10, verse 35 and 36. And I have it behind me there. And whenever the ark 
Whenever the ark set, uh, set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, when the ark comes to a stop, when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. And so that's, that was Moses' prayer when he's designing and, and developing all of these uh, different, uh, what they called utensils for the, uh, for the temple there. And he's putting, or for the tabernacle, and he's putting it all together and, and making sure everybody's doing it the right way from the plans that God gave him and doing all of that. And he quotes that there. And so David, as he starts off, he starts off with that very thing there. And so, some, again, some more of that imagery that's there. And so, when God arises or when God appears, look at the effect that it has on his enemies in verse 1 and 2, to the righteous in verse 3 and 4, and for those in need in verse 5 and 6. I think that's beautifully kind of laid out of this start to this incredible psalm that he, that he writes here. In verse 2, it's interesting of what he calls the enemy or likens them unto. There's two similes that are there. It starts with the word as. And so they're as smoke or as wax there. And who's afraid of a little, smell, a, a little smoke or a, a melting candle? And that's like our enemy. Those that are attacking us today, those that were attacking him back then. That's the imagery that, that he gives us there. And so picture your enemy. Maybe you're struggling with somebody at work or whatever else in that way. As I said, I love verse 5. God protects the most vulnerable. And he says it, as it, says it here with the fatherless and, uh, and, and the widows. But really, it's, it's just the, those are the ones in both Old and New Testament and biblical times. They were the most vulnerable. Today, we have... Uh, you know, oftentimes it'll be this, the same category, but I think we can expand it out uh, to those that are vulnerable in our, in our day and age. And so he protects the vulnerable, which reveals both his compassion and his justice. His compassion towards those that fit into that category and his justice against those that take advantage of them, right? And so with the fatherless, we have the orphans and children in foster care hoping to be able to find a, a forever family, uh, this touches, I think, single moms whose children don't, don't have a dad and so they're having to be mom and dad and, and with that he cares and he knows and he sees. And for the widows, again, I think we can add any that are vulnerable today, kids on the streets, the homeless, the runaways, the, those that are being human, you know, trafficked. And then that beautiful promise in verse six that he settles the solitary in a home or the lonely, or the single, and the families. And if you think, well, wait a minute, I, I fit into that category and I don't feel like I have a family. I think that's where, what your church family is supposed to be all about. There's a number of people that find themselves single, find themselves, whether it's lonely, find themselves in a, in a place where hopefully that's what the church will become for you, to be able to develop great friendships that are here, deep friendships not just uh, acquaintances, as we all have many acquaintances, but to be able to, you know, go to that deeper level in talking about the important things of, of life, but hopefully your, your church, family, you'll find yourselves there and helping with that, the loneliness. Not, our single, not all singles are lonely. When I said that earlier, I didn't mean to put that in the same, you know what I mean? Okay, anyways. Let's read our next section, the March of God, verse seven through 10. Oh God, when you went out, so now David's directly, talking to him directly in, in this section here. Oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, that's God leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness before they made it to the promised land. So that's the imagery there. The earthquake, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Sinai. Then he says, rain in abundance. Oh God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance, most likely speaking of the land, the promised land, as it languished. Your flock or your congregation found a, a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O oh God, you provided for the needy. So God is here praised directly. 
And again, in these different sections, all of a sudden he's kind of shifts and goes to this area. Now he's just talking directly to him. And we, we watch as one scene moves to another. Even in this section, it's a whole bunch of just Israel's history here of the Exodus march, talking about verse 7. The theophany at Sinai, that's Moses. Uh, theophany, the appearance of God. Moses meeting God at the top of, of Sinai. That's mentioned in 8. And also the, the mighty rainstorm, it, it's alluded to, which defeated Sisera. That's Judges chapter 5, verse 4. Then finally, as he kind of wraps up towards verse 10 there, to the gentler blessings of the rain. Your desert people, that's who his audience is. That's who he's talking to. And they understood the, the need for rain, the need for water year by year, which again points to God's goodness, to his goodness. Our next one is the crushing of kings in 11 through 14. So we're kind of doing just running commentary here. 11 through 14 says, The Lord gives the word. The women who announce the news are a great host. The word host is usually interpreted as tzava, and it means an army. So, a great, uh, so these women who announce the news are a great army. And they say this. They're like singing this next phrase. The kings of the armies the armies that are against the Lord, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil and then kind of a slam on the men, though you men lie among the sheepfolds. There's inaction there. They're not doing anything. And it says the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions with shimmering gold. And when the Almighty scatters kings there, let snow fall on Zalman. And so again, very poetic language and it takes us a lot to kind of dig in to figure out what's happening here. And uh, one thing I notice in verse 14, when the Almighty uses that word Almighty, you know that, I forget if it's 22, 24 times the word God. But then as uh, I think it was Wesley had said, but then there's this whole cornucopia, he said, this whole cornucopia of different titles for God all the way through it. So it places the word Almighty here. And the reason I make any mention of it, it's only used two times in all of the Psalms, only two times. So this is one of the, the, the times that it's here. One was a little bit earlier. And, uh, and so he mentions of God being the Almighty or Shaddai. We've heard of El Shaddai, God Shaddai, God the Mighty One. The ladies here were getting the job done. The guys asleep. I think what the allusion to is the song of Dedra, Deborah. We were talking about Judges 5 earlier and that's where her story is there. She was one of the judges of Israel at a time where the guys weren't stepping up. And she was in, encouraging Barak and, uh, to be able to go forward and lead. I'll be there with you, but go for it. And, and uh, he wimps out and Deborah's got to do it. And she steps in and God uses her in a radical way. And so the song of Deborah Still echoing in these verses from what was already mentioned there. But the crushing of the kings or God's enemies in these other nations, basically. Next, in 15 through 18, we have the Mount of Glory. O mountain of God, in verse 15, mountain of Bashan, a mini-peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan. This is the Golan Heights today is that area. Why do you look with hatred, O mini-peaked mountain? At the mount, most likely Zion, that God desired for his abode. Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The, the chariots of God are twice 10,000. And so basically God's army is very large. Thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. And Sinai is now in the sanctuary. Verse 18, you ascended on high leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. And so the imagery, you send it on high. This victorious king returns to his throne after you know, defeating the, uh, the enemies that are there. And so this uh, Bashan was just the other side of the Jordan, kind of upper country of Jordan today that moves over into the top part of Israel. That was the Bashan kind of mountain range that's there. But this Bashan is also known as the gateway to the underworld and its sinister inhabitants that are there. And so paganism is there. 
And so he's challenging Bashan. He's, he's drawing this contrast before this wicked mountain because a lot of times they would, uh, they would worship their pagan deities up in these mountain areas there. And so he draws a contrast. Excuse me, down in Jerusalem, little Zion there. It's comparing it to, uh, you know, up in Bashan is where part of Mount Hermon is. So Mount Hermon's about 9,700 feet. Zion's about... 2,200 feet and so it's a it's a hill that's what we would call it today our our hills along here are about a thousand a uh, little over a thousand you know feet and so Zion's a real small hill but that's kind of the paradox that that what God is you know putting forth here it's the paradox that that God loves he loves choosing the underdog to show his own glory God chose Zion for his abode it says in verse 16 there just like he chose David uh, to write this psalm who was chosen out of all of his brothers and he was the young one and he was the one where dad didn't even recommend him to Samuel as he's looking to find the next king he's he's out with the sheep right he's, he's not even saying oh I have one more boy until Samuel ask him is this all your boys you don't have any more well there's one he's a little guy he's out just watching the sheep bring him here right and and so with that he was despised in that way and seen as the youngest the smallest uh, and all of that and and that's where God says that's who I want to use that's who's going to be our next king I'm picking David I'm choosing David or little Be Bethlehem what was Bethlehem known for it was just a, a small little village town and and uh and, and so with that he loves that paradox going for the underdog to show his glory. And even in this case with Zion, this little hill. In verse 18, you ascended on high. Again, in this case, a victorious king returning to his throne and, and because he was victorious over his enemies and doing all of that. But Paul lifts this here, uses it in Ephesians chapter four, verse eight. And so he quotes this to describe Christ's victory over the powers of darkness and talking about Christ's own ascension, and so he lifts it and, and uses it over there, which I think is interesting. All right, let's look at 19 through 20. God, our burden bearer. Just these two verses here. Blessed be the Lord who dare, dare let me try it again. I was gonna say dairy, daily bears us up. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God, the Lord, belong deliverances from death. Do you hear how many times he says God or the God, the God of salvation. He just keeps you over and over and he uses it so many different times. God, our burden bearer. What a, what a burden. I hope you're overloaded with the burden that he's talking about right here. God's blessing. I, I hope you know God's blessing like this blessing in verse 19 that he's talking about here. Blessed be the Lord who, dearly, who daily, I don't know, I can't say daily today, that daily bears us up. That means whatever backpack of weight we walk into our day, we have at work, we have with friends, we have with neighbors, we have with a spouse, we have with one of our kids, whatever, whatever that burden is of weight that is on you, God comes alongside and gets his shoulder under it and lifts it daily. That's what he does for his kids. He wants you to experience that also. He wants me to experience that. Our, our mistake is that we don't realize that God is bearing our burdens. And a lot of times our cry unto God is, look at this burden that I'm bearing. And I, well, I'm sure he's saying, that's the problem. You're trying to solve it on your own, solve this problem on your own. You're, you're trying to carry it on your own. Why are you doing that? This is a great verse right here. Blessed be the Lord who dare, daily, I don't know why I can't say that, daily bears us up. That's what our God does. Let's hold on to that. We often think we must deal with our burdens. So we let ourselves worry as though we're the loneliest or most deserted or most pitiable beings in existence when all the while God's ready to bear our burdens. We simply need to ask him. That needs to be our, our prayer. I, when I can't figure it out, when I can't lift it anymore, when I'm just wiped out and all those different things, he's ready to come alongside of us and help us. Whether it's the burden of our, our sins, Lord, take them away when we come to the communion table. God, forgive me for what I did today, for my mouth, 
for what plays around in my, in my head, little videotape that plays in my mind, for the thoughts, for the lusts, for whatever other desires. And so we bring him the burden of our sins, the burden of our anxieties about our, ourselves and about others, the burden of our frailties and infirmities, the burden of responsibility of, of keeping us. We don't have to keep ourselves. We're told in a few different places at the very end of James in the New Testament there. We don't, if, if it took his grace to save us, we couldn't save ourselves. Why do you think you can keep yourself saved if, if you couldn't get saved yourself in the first place? And yet we're trying to do all these works and trying to do all these things to make sure that he still likes this kind of thing. And it's like, why, why are we doing that? He keeps us. That is his job. Only he can, only he can save us, only he can keep us safe. That is God's deal, right? And so with that, it's, it's again, bringing that to him, the burden of the, the pressure of our daily needs. Saints, all of these things that we mentioned rest daily upon his shoulders. It's just taking it off our shoulder and putting them on, on his Tis enough that he should care, why should we the burden bear? He cares to cast our burdens upon him. Oh, that verse is up there, Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. It's a command. He tells us to do that. Don't keep it yourself. Cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. He'll never permit the righteous to be moved. Wow, that's one to meditate on. Never, never permit the righteous to be moved. Cast your bur burden. The Hebrew word for burden literally means what he has given you. This thought seems to be like this. Take back to God and cast upon him the burden that he laid on you, because that's where it came from, and he'll sustain you under it. And so he's put some heavy burden on you of some work situation that you're going, I don't know how to figure this out. I don't know what to do and everything else. And he knows it so well, he placed it on you. Why? To make us go running to him and say, God, I need your help. All right. And he takes off that burden. That seems to be the imagery and kind of from the, the literal Hebrew word there of, of what's taking place. He will sustain you under it. He's giving it to you to bring you to himself. He knows us. We get too busy with our stuff and life and just busy with a lot in our heads and a lot going on in our families and work and hobbies and everything else. And we should get busy doing those things. And so he lovingly will place this weight on our shoulders. So we'll come running back to him and saying, can you help me with this weight? And he says, yeah, thanks for asking so Jesus is willing to be fully responsible for the things we are anxious about, worried about, burdened about. Jesus is willing to be fully responsibility for those things. Can you own that? Do you believe that? When the heart is lightened of its load, man, it'll soar. Give us this day our daily blessing of verse 19, Lord. <laughs> Let's make that our prayer. Let's look at the next one. 21 through 23. God's destruction of his enemy. This is pretty brutal. But God will strike the heads of his enemies, the hairy crown or the hairy head of him who walks in his guilty ways. The Lord said, I'll bring them back from Bashan. I'll bring them back from the depths of the sea that you may strike your feet in their blood that the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from the foe. Huh, that's ugly. What he's talking about, I'll bring them back from Bashan, from the mountaintops of Bashan to the depths of the sea. I will find every enemy of mine, everyone who has spoken against me, everyone that would not bow their knee to me, I will take care of them. And we have like with Armageddon and final battles and those kind of things that there's like in Revelation 14 with the, you know, the radical bloodshed that's, that's going to be there. And so he says that that's what's going to happen. And there even brings out the dogs that we have a few times in the Old Testament and come lick up the blood. And it's just a, a gory scene there. But there will be God's destruction of his enemies. And so that's what it says. That's what it's talking about. He'll one day completely destroy his enemies. 
Not, not going to merely scatter them. That's what it said in verse 1. That's what it said in verse 14. But there comes a day where it's not just scattering the enemies to get them away from his own. But he'll dil- diligently search them from the heights to the depths to destroy them. And that's an inference of Amos chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. The extent of God's destruction of enemies reveals his power to save and protect his people. So as I take care of the enemy, understand it's because I'm watching over you and protecting you. And so there's always that contrast as he goes through this. And in verse 23, it it reeks of blood, but not bloodlust. It's not killing for killing's sake. It's not God woke up on the wrong side of the cloud and all of a sudden he's just going berserk one day and just I'm going to start just, you know, chopping off heads. That's not what's happening there. This is judgment, not imperialism, right? He's not trying to take over or conquer his enemies in that way. No, it's, it's their, again, their final judgment. Verse 24 through 27. Now that the enemy is done, it's his procession, like a king would do once he takes over his enemies. Coming back in town, they do a huge procession. And again, the, uh, the, the victor, the, the king is going to sit on his throne. And so it's kind of that part of that procession. It says, your procession is seen, O God, the procession of my God, my king, into the sanctuary. The singers in front, the musicians last, and bet- between them, the virgins playing the tambourines. Bless God in the congregation, the Lord O oh, you who are of Israel's uh, fountain, there's Benjamin, the least of them in the lead, the princes of Judah and their throng, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali. So this victorious procession follows God's victory. And so the psalmist describes the singers, musicians, the young girls who take their part in the celebration. The reason he mentions Benjamin and Judah, they simply represent the southern kingdom of Israel, of Judah. Uh, Zebulon and Naphtali, they represent the northern kingdom. And so he's saying when there was the divided kingdom, he's, he's bringing everybody together. He's talking about just all of Israel in that and celebrating with him there. Two more sections, 28 through 31. Summon your power, O God, the power, O God, by which you have worked for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, the kings shall bear gifts to you. Rebuke rebuke the beasts that dwell among the reeds, the herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples. Trample underfoot those who lust after tribute. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Nobles shall come from uh, Egypt. Cush shall hasten to stretch out their hands to God. Both Egypt and Cush there in those days were actually part of Ethiopia, southern Sudan, that kind of area right there. And so the psalmist calls on God Hey, use your strength to destroy the enemies of his people. He refers to God's past acts of salvation, encouraging God to display his power to save again. He compares their enemies to to animals and describes the enemies as those who love war. God doesn't love war, but he's not afraid to fight when he has to against his enemies. Last section. And it's kind of how he started it. It's another parade of praise towards our God. Verse 32, O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, Selah, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, ascribe power to God or give power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies or as high as the sky. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. And he ends with blessed be God. And so we started with this parade of praise for Israel alone. That was David was speaking about him and Israel at the time. But now it ends with a parade of praise that's universal. O kingdoms of the earth. That's us. That's the Gentiles included in that in the end times. And so with that, this the second parade of praise, we're invited into that. And so the invitation of, hey, so for any unbeliever out there in any kingdom, instead of being destroyed by God, and so that's the other, that's the flip side of the coin, right? You don't have to go that route. Don't go that route. Don't be destroyed by God. Instead, praise him as the sovereign victorious king for whom he is. 
And so it's kind of evangelical in that sense right there. One of the commentators asked the question, is, is your life more like marching like a conqueror in a victory celebration or like a mourner in a funeral procession? Which one more depicts your life? See, I love how th this climax is one of the almost uncontainable enthusiasm towards our, our God. You, you, you read it and you just, want to, you just want to praise him for who he is. It's just that, that reminder. That's why David is penning this. Led by the Holy Spirit, of course. But as he's penning that for those back in that day, and still for us in 2022, to be able to pause, remind yourself for, for who God is, praise him this evening, lift up his name, and then think through, even tonight as you go home, what am I dealing with? What burden am I carrying? Why am I carrying it? He's, he's, he's inviting us to come and, and let him do that for us. He so loves us as his children that he says, let me help, let me help. Cry out unto me. It's the same story over and over again of, of just a reminder to us. And so let's give him that parade of praise. Even in the last song, I'll invite our, our worship team back up and I'll pray as we come back up. But we'll have one more song to just, just do that. Just focus in on thinking about who your God is and praise him in that. Father, we, we thank you for this, uh, this psalm that David penned. We look forward to meeting our friend David one day. What an interesting character that we find him and uh, find and learn about him in scripture. But Lord, this, this psalm is all about you and esteeming you. Thank you, God, for relieving us of our, our burdens. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you for entrusting us with the weight. And it's simply you nudging us to say, hey, I miss you. I want you to enjoy my presence. I want you to call out to me. I want you to cry out to me. Because once again today, yep, we need God. We need him in every aspect of our life. And so we cry out unto you, Lord. And now, Lord, we just praise your holy and awesome and righteous name. In Jesus' name, amen.